Hey Grinder School and welcome to episode number five of why I still love the micros. Ah oh, crap, just got started. My dog already wants to go outside. That's pretty typical. Hold on guys, I've got to uh, I've got to let my dog out. Be right back. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> As I was saying, we're up to episode number five of why I still love the micros. Have some interesting hands today. Um, I want to quickly explain that uh, in the last several months I've been focusing a lot more on doing series uh, as you know rather than doing a lot of live play videos. I've done a couple of reviews of sessions that I've played where I record them and then do the audio after the fact. Haven't done much live play. A couple of reasons for that. One is that I just I play a pretty tight game as you guys know. I sit back and I wait for strong spots and strong opportunities and as a result there often is not a ton of action and the whole point of you know why I still love the micros is to point out how profitable and easy it is to play that style. In a lot of games you can't get away with that. You can't sit back and nut pedal as they call it. In micro stakes PLO you can. But for example here's a, a session that I played uh, here we go on Bavada. Okay, so the bottom here shows all the hands. You know, there's a hand replayer. So I want you to look and see. And you take a look. I got this one big hand where I want a bunch of money. In fact, we'll be reviewing this hand today. And look at the rest of this session. All these little tiny reds are where I lost my blind. Five cents, ten cents, two cents, you know, really tiny amounts. Ten cents, five cents, ten cents, five cents. I win a couple of small on a dollar here. And and you can see I just don't really there's no action. And there have been sessions where even playing three tables, four tables, there just isn't a ton of action going on. And so it'd be kind of boring for you guys to really watch. It's, to me, more productive to pick out the hands where there is some action and look at those after the fact. But I will be doing some, uh, some more live play in the very near future. So just want to say that and bear with me. Uh, you know, when I first started playing in PLO, I watched all of the videos at Grinder School uh, of PLO. At that time, it was Mr. Padawan and Spenda and U-Boat, who had not long before that become a PLO instructor. What I realized after watching seven or eight of Mr. Padawan's videos was that, uh, I, I, to be frank, I really didn't think he was that strong of a player. And I've told Jeffrey Blake this myself. Uh, he played a fairly loose game. And I would say 70% of the videos I watched, he lost money in those videos, the live play that he did. I just didn't like his style of play and didn't think it was all that effective. But I remember him commenting in one of the videos where he was playing sort of loose and he'd already lost a buy-in or two that, well, you know, guys, you can't just sit back and nut pedal. You have to get involved. You have to make some bluffs. You know, you have to take some chances. Obviously, there's, there's some truth to that, but... I think I've proven in this series, why well, I still love the micros, and in several others of mine, that you can sit back and nut pedal. You absolutely can do that. There may be other games where you can't do that, and there may be higher stakes than this where you can't do that. But up to 25 PLO, and maybe even a bit higher, you absolutely can sit back and nut pedal. And so I disagree with Mr. Padawan. I'm not saying he's some idiot or some fool. I'm not saying I'm right and he's wrong. Or vice versa, I'm just saying I disagree. And in fact, I stopped watching his videos and I watched Spenda's videos. Spenda was a very strong uh, PLO player, in my opinion. I learned a lot of great stuff from his. And then I watched all of U-Boat's videos and then studied a lot on my own, read several books, and then ultimately became an instructor myself. But I will be doing some more live play videos soon. But I want to just say that I have not focused much on those because there just hasn't been a lot of action. I've been really card dead the last few months it seems and just playing big pots here and there and the rest of the time there isn't much to see and I want to be sure that you guys get some decent action in the videos. At any rate let's get started on the hands for today. This first one is from uh, Juicy Steaks. Uh, I want to point out that I am showing the cards here for this hand because I want to <clears throat> This isn't going, this hand is not being shown from any kind of a strategy perspective. This is purely being shown as to, well, I guess why I, I still love the micros and what kind of stuff you'll see 
at these stakes. This guy has played a lot against La Vega, and he's just a, oh, a horrible, horrible whale. And so I guess it's no surprise maybe what he does. This might be more surprising over here with Momoko. But I guess this is an okay hand to limp, 4-4, four, 10-10. Four, ten, ten. You do have two pairs, so you could hit a set, two chances to hit a set. This guy has to realize, though, that this guy's probably going to raise because he raises every hand. You can't get in cheaply against La Vega. And look at his three bet, 38%. I don't even play 38% of hands total, and he three bets. Uh, but he only has, you know, 41 cents left, so I guess at this point this guy doesn't care. He comes along. This is an okay hand to limp, I guess. But again, you're doing this. You have to realize this guy's going to raise because that's all he ever does. I decide just to limp this rather than raise my aces with a suit and connected cards because I know that La Vega is going to raise. And then I can re-raise him if I want to and try to get a bunch of money in when I'm just way ahead of his range. No surprise, he does exactly what we expect him to do. And then this guy, I guess, just says, screw it, I'll put my last 41 cents in. I think that's stupid, as you know. I don't care if you're playing for two cents or $2 million. You should use the same strategy, pretty much. Uh, and so I, I just think to get down to a certain amount and say, screw it, I'll just throw the money in. I just think that's a silly way to play. And not because of the money, but just because I think it's stupid. He calls. Uh, I don't have a problem with this, but it's not a particularly strong hand. Well, this gives me the chance to now re-raise. I'm really trying to, to, you know, he's already all in, but I'm figuring Momoko will give it up if he's beginning. I'm just trying to get in against this guy with my aces with a suit and see if I can't maybe double up. He'd been playing wild and crazy as usual. He'd won a few lucky pots, but I, I know that I'm, it's PLO, anything can happen, but I know that I'm way ahead of his range. And of course, he's going to call. This is really surprising. And this guy just stuffs the rest of his stack in this Momoko. As you can see, 28-14, he's a solid tag. I've played a lot against this player, and I was really surprised to see this. Maybe against him. And frankly speaking, this hand against that hand is just basically a coin flip. Uh, but against my range, when I do this and put this in, you know, he's just not doing very well. Uh, obviously, we don't. I don't have a huge advantage because it is PLO, you know, percentage-wise. But I'm just saying, well, why would you want to put your whole stack in with seven, eight, eight, Jack? I just don't see it. Uh, so, but again, this is the micros, and people will sometimes do this stuff. And now and then he gets wild, and I was really surprised, but quite happy. Now, I would have put my whole stack in. The software only allows you to do this. I was not allowed to re-raise again, or I would have. I just had to call and wait till the flop to put it in. There wasn't enough of a difference between 184 and 265, I guess, for me to be able to do any more than that. Same with him. All he can do is call. It's pot limit, and so he does. So the flop comes down. Well, this guy flops a set, but it's obviously very vulnerable against three people. I've got a flush draw. <clears throat> This guy, four, five, six, seven, has a straight draw. Uh, bottom set is very vulnerable on this board, as we know. He doesn't flop anything. And this is why I didn't like his play. This hand can smack a flop or it can do nothing. Well, at this point, I'm just going to put the rest of my money in. I have an over pair and I have the nut flush draw. I obviously can't see their cards. I don't care what he has. I don't guess anymore care what he has. He's all in. I only care about this guy. And I know that I'm ahead of his range. And so I dump the rest of my money in. Now, he could save $1.16 here. Uh, he has the open-ended straight draw, but, you know, hearts are no good to him. He doesn't know that. But against three opponents, I'd be thinking hearts are very possibly no good to me. With people willing to get their money in all in preflop, you know they got suited hands. He has a suited hand. He has a suited hand. I have a suited hand. He has to figure somebody has hearts. So his open-ended straight draw really only gives him six outs and that's not a lot of equity six outs is not a lot of outs but of course he's a donkey so he puts in that buck 16 now everybody's all in i hit my flush on the turn and that's all she wrote and i pick up a really big pot as i stack well, I stack two players and I take a bunch of money from him. He had about $12 to start and he's down to eight. 
and I take everybody's money. And so I end up with $10 and I started the hand with less than $4. So as you can see, when people are willing to put their whole stack in with hands like this and hands like this, two, five, six, nine, that's a good thing. And these are the opportunities that you want to be looking for. And that's why, as I've told you, I disagree <clears throat> with Mr. Padawan. Respectfully, I disagree. You can nut pedal in PLO. And a lot of the time, that's exactly what I do. Okay, let's move on to our uh, next hand. Let's see, where the heck is it? I guess that's going to be here. Actually, I've got to find the exact hand I want. So let me pause this and I will be right back. <clears throat> okay, guys, I'm back. We're going to be looking at a couple hands from this session played five or six days ago. And again, I want to point out, here's a whole bunch of hands at a table. Notice I got two big hands where I want a bunch of money. And look at all the rest. I'm just folding. I'm just not getting cards. And look, there's a couple of small ones here. And just a whole bunch of hands where there's just nothing really going on. So this is why I've sort of, again, stayed away from the live play videos, but I will be doing some more of those soon. Uh, let me enlarge this. This needs to be bigger. I'm going to make this bigger. Okay. Now you guys can see what's going on. This is what we need. Okay, here we go. And this is some, uh, looks like some 10 PLO at the Bavada Network. <clears throat> get a limp, get another limp. This guy raises. If he hadn't raised, I probably would have. Sometimes I will limp this behind. I have crappy side cards, 3-9, obviously. So, but on the button, I'll more often raise it here. There's obviously no reason to, to three bet. My side cards aren't good enough. I'm not even double suited. But I am going to call because I do have aces with a suit. And anytime you have aces with a suit in PLO, you generally want to want to play the hand from pretty much any position. We get another call there and another here. So we're going to go four-handed to the flop. We've already got 235 in there. And we haven't even seen a flop yet. And I flop the nut flush. That's always nice. And I want to point out, this is why we tend to play suited aces in PLO. Uh, I don't uh, necessarily call a raise with just a suited ace. So if I hadn't had a pair of aces here, but just the suited ace, I would have limped behind, especially on the button. I don't know that I would have called 55 cents if I didn't have this pair of aces. I don't think it's enough to just have a suited ace. But I will say the times you hit a flush, it can be very powerful, more so than in Hold'em. People will definitely pay you off uh, with lesser flushes. The reason it's more powerful is because in Hold'em, it's just so much less likely that anybody else has a flush. I think it's harder to get paid. In PLO, with people having four cards and almost every flop being multi-way, so almost every flop, you're going three, four away to the flop, sometimes five, but the average is three to four there's just a very good chance that somebody else has a flush also beside you. And that's where you get paid off. Sometimes, yes, with people do it with two pair or a set, but it's certainly uh, quite often that someone else has a flush. In Hold'em, it just doesn't happen as often. If we were four away to the flop in Hold'em, it'd be very unlikely with just two cards each that anybody else would have a flush but myself. Now, people might be a little less likely to believe you have a flush, but you're a tight player, you start putting money in, you're probably not going to get paid off <clears throat> in Hold'em. So now this becomes obviously about trying to extract value. So the pot's 235. Well, this guy leads into everybody else, full pot. Now we see he's 6418. For PLO, that's on the loose side, but it's not excessively loose. Um, I've seen way, way, way looser than this. In fact, I got a guy right next to him at 80 zero, only five hands. Uh, this is uh, loose, but not particularly loose. So when he does this into three people, we got to figure he's probably got a pretty good hand. 
I have the nut flush, so we would figure him for what, like a king or a queen high flush? So these both fold. It comes to me and the question is, do I want to raise or just call? You can do either one. We've seen these type of situations in my video series, Call, Fold, or Raise. This case, I believe I decided to just call, and I did. This guy's a little aggressive, but 2.0 isn't, isn't particularly aggressive, quite frankly. It's more when you get up towards 2.5 and, and 3. Uh, and this isn't the best indicator, just aggression factor, but it's all I have with this limited HUD. I decide to just call uh, <clears throat> because I'm up against one opponent. I'm less afraid of the board pairing. If this guy had called and this guy had called, now I think I have to raise because I have to be worried about sets and two pairs that can get to full houses and beat me. In this case, with just one opponent, I don't have to worry nearly as much about those things. It's a lot less likely that somebody's going to catch up and beat me. It can still happen, believe you me, but uh, I'm a lot less worried about it. And quite frankly, with 235 left in a 705 pot, if the board paired here against one opponent, I'm not going to fold. If he got there, then he got there, but I'm going to pay him off, but I'm not going to fold. Against three people, it's a whole nother, whole nother story. So I just call. The turn does not pair the board, which is nice. Doesn't change anything from my perspective. I still have the nuts. It brings a straight out there. A lot of times with just one opponent, people think a straight is good. And uh, so he's out 336 left. I don't know why I said 235. Uh, but I still probably wouldn't, wouldn't fold against one opponent here. So he dumps the rest of the money in. I'm obviously calling since I have the nuts. Let's see what our opponent has. And as you can see, he has a 10 high flush the fifth nut flush. He can't beat an ace. He can't beat a king. He can't beat a queen. He can't beat a jack. So think about it, guys. Let's look at how this guy played the hand. Limping in, okay, he's got a pair of tens, connected cards, a suit. Not that, again, the suit means that much, and here's exactly why. This is exactly why the suit doesn't mean much, because if you do hit a flush, you're either going to win a small pot or you're going to lose a big one. And I think you know which one of the two happened this time. The guy raises to 55 cents. He calls. He speculates. Okay, he could flop a set, could flop a straight, could hit a, you know, a good straight draw. I'm all right with, with seeing a flop. When this flop comes, I do not believe he should be leading full pot into three other players. It's not like everybody checked and then he bet full pot. He led into three people. He doesn't know what we have. Look what I've got. That was really dumb. And this is why I love the micros, because people do really stupid shit things like that. That's just, I don't know, I can't even really explain that. I guess he was thinking if I bet full pot, maybe I'll scare these guys off. They're going to have a big, and if they don't have flushes, they have to fold, and I take down a nice size pot. Oh, yeah, because the pot was 235, you know, before we even saw a card. And if somebody calls me, well, hey, I do have a flush. I might be good. What I think he failed to realize is the standard old adage that we talk about so much at Grinder School and that I say so much in my videos and, and on, the, uh, on the forums when I'm uh, weighing in on somebody's hand history. The only thing you get called by here is pretty much hands that beat you, especially when you bet that big. You bet half pot. You know, somebody with two pair or a set might call you, hoping to hit their full house. Or seeing if you're going to barrel the next street, wondering how strong you really are. When you bet full pot like that, on a monotone board, I think the only thing, because if I had a set, I'd probably have to fold. I don't have enough odds with full pot bets to, to hit my full house. Only thing he's getting called by is hands that beat him, like this. Especially with only a 10 high. Not like he has a queen high flush here. And there's just the ace and the king out there to beat him. There are ace, king, queen, and jack out there. This is just beyond horrendous. I don't really even, like I said, know how to explain it. Uh, he's not, if this guy was 94, 63, okay. You know my expression. That's what donkeys do. 
But in this case, I, I don't even have an explanation. And when he saw my hand, he must have just said, oh, jeez. Probably said, how unlucky am I? No, sir, you're not unlucky. You're stupid. I, I don't mean to be cruel to this person or insensitive or nasty, but uh, this could have been avoided. He didn't need to lose more than 55 cents. Under the gun, in this situation, against four people, he should have just checked. I would have bet, when it came to me, probably half pot, he could decide if he wanted to call maybe one street. You notice I'm the tightest player at the table. As usual, I think he should have thought twice. I don't even know that a half pot uh, bet call is worthwhile against the tightest player at the table. Yes, I'm in position, but like I said, you're going to either you know win a small pot or lose a big one. Because even in position here, guys, if I don't hit a flush, I'm not betting when everybody else checks. People will often check with the nut flush. They're under the gun or something you know they're they're out of position and wait for somebody else to bet and then try to take more money that way or check raise them so if these guys had all checked and i didn't have this flush i just have a pair of aces or something i'm not going to bet and certainly not full pot so he just misplayed this hand every which way but loose i really can't even like i said describe it and as a result he loses his entire stack and that didn't have to happen was easily, easily avoidable, but he played it very poorly, and, you know, sadly, he got what he deserved, and I win a big pot, and it was just really dumb, and I guess, again, that's why I love the micros, but this didn't have to happen. If he thinks he got unlucky, he's, that's, he's very sadly mistaken. I'm not saying for sure that's how he felt, but I've seen a lot of people say that. All right, let's look at our next hand here. And this is at the same table about 20 hands later. <clears throat> Here I am on the button. Very nice starting hand. 10-10 King Jack, double suited. All Broadway, pair of 10s, two suits. Really nice hand to see a flop with. Plus I'm in position. I'd be calling a raise from anybody with this hand. I'd probably call a three bet. If he raised and he three bet, I'd probably still want to see a flop with this hand most of the time. I might not call a four bet, but I think I'd call a three bet. We get a limp. We we'll get a fold. So the question is, do I raise or do I just call? I probably just called. You know my adage, I just like to get in cheaply and see if I hit a flop. As strong as this hand is, there's still a lot of boards it misses. You know, I was playing a session today and I got a very, very rare hand in PLO. Ace Ace King King double suited. That is the number one strongest starting hand in all of PLO. You think of all the possible starting combinations in PLO. And remember, there are six times as many as there are in Hold'em. So I forget how many possible starting combinations there are in PLO uh, 1067 or something like that. The very strongest one is Ace Ace King King double suited. Some people say it's Ace Ace 10 Jack double suited because you have a little more straight possibilities versus the two I pairs. But the majority of people say it's Ace Ace King King. And I got that hand. You might get that hand a couple times a year. Uh, so, of course, I raised uh, three callers. Uh, the flop came something like 458 with a two tone, not the suit, either of the suits that I had, and I had to fold. Somebody bit pot and I had to fold right off the bat. So, it doesn't matter how strong your starting hand is. You miss the flop, you're done. And that's why I often limp these. And I very probably limped here. I did. I'm prepared to call a raise if somebody raises, but. If I can get in cheaply, I still think that is the best way to go. See, so this guy in the small ball, now he suddenly raises 73.27. Obviously a laggy player. Look at the aggression factor. I'm going to call this, but I didn't feel the need to do it myself. So we all call. This didn't really accomplish anything unless he was doing it for pure value. Once again, we have a $2 pot before we even see a card. And... I flop top set. Always nice when that happens. On a relatively dry board, there is a possible, actually two possible straight draws out there. Even when the board is dry in PLO, it's not dry. There's the three to the six straight draw. Somebody can have four, five, or some combination. And there's the six to the 10. A bigger gap there, but somebody could be sitting there with seven, eight, nine, or combos like that. People still can have draws on this board. The good news is there's no flush draw. 
We like that, except if it maybe would have been a spade. Flush draw for us. So the guy that raised checks. So we have a, a $2 pot, and this guy bets 21 cents. As you guys know, I really don't understand why people do that. Uh, if you're sitting there with top pair or two pair and you're not really sure, you don't want to commit a lot of money, but you don't really want to fold, and just check. You think that looks weak? People check all the time. Okay, Just check. Doing this is just silly. You might as well take out a full page ad in the New York Times that says, I'm weak. I, I have a hand that I just really am not that confident with, so I'm going to bet tiny. You know what I mean? You might as well just tell the world. Just turn your cards face up if you're going to do this. Every now and then, somebody will do this with a really strong hand. But 90% of the time, it's, it's just a hand they're not very confident in. And you're just telling the world that. It's just really dumb. This guy calls when now it comes to me. Well, I think you all know that I'm going to be raising here. For value, I, I don't want to play for 21 cents in a pot this big. I'm just not going to get enough value. I flop top set. I need you don't you know you don't do that very often. I, I need to take advantage of it. I also don't want to let them draw cheaply. One of these guys could easily be drawing, and uh, I don't want to give them a cheap card. So we need to raise it up. That's not enough money. Now, if this guy had bet a dollar fifty and he'd called, I'd still probably raise. But I might give a tiny bit of thought to slow playing it because this is a somewhat dry board. Probably would still raise, though, to be frank. That's too much money. That's three dollars out there that I can take. So even then, I'm almost positive I'd raise. Against one opponent, I might call. Against two, I don't think so. So I'm going to be raising, I guess, no matter what here, but for sure here. So I make it 213. Not as big as I absolutely could, but a nice raise. This guy folds, so his 50 cent raise pre flop was a waste. This idiot who made it 21 cents folds. Should have just checked. Well, this guy calls. So what does he have that he didn't want to raise himself with, but he's willing to call a big raise by me? I don't think he has a set of sixes or a set of threes. I think he would have, I would hope he would have raised. But we can see he's very passive. 37 hands, he's 84-0. Look at his aggression frequency. He's very stationary. Check call, check call, check call. Very passive. We're hoping he has a set lower than ours. S unless he hits quads, we're going to be probably taking his stack. Well, I'm not exactly thrilled with that turn card. And now you can see why even the driest of boards is never dry in PLO. Well, now it brings in a possible straight. 4-7 got there and 2-4 got there. But he's got 244 left, 647 pot. I've only got to be good one in four times or so, 25% or something like that. I don't think I'm going to be folding here. If he got there, I guess he got there. He checks, of course. That's what he does. I bet exactly 244. Put him all in. He calls. Let's see what he has. So look at this. So on the flop, he had a pair of 10s. That's it. Top pair, nothing else. No draw. I mean, ace, five, three, six. It's not even a gut shot. A backdoor flush, I guess. He called my raise of 213. He called that with just top pair. The turn gives him two pair, 10s and fives. That's not really, they couldn't even beat 10s and 6s, couldn't beat any set. And he was willing to, when I bet 244, he has to know that I have something. Again, 22-7, look at my numbers. So again, this is what I point out. He's been at the table, he's seen me for 37 hands. I'm the tightest player at the table. Well, this guy's 2013, I guess. So I guess the, him and this guy and me are tied. Does he really think that I'm going to put that much money in with, with worse than 10-5? Than and certainly with worse than top pair. I mean, this is just horribly played, in my opinion. So now he's, he's basically drawn dead. You know, what can he hit to beat me? 
I don't think there's a card that can save him. Right? If he, a five will give me a, a higher full house, right? Well, I'll have tens over fives. Yeah, he'd have fives over tens, so that won't help him. There's no more tens left. He's drawn dead. There's not a card in the deck that will save him. King comes didn't matter anyway. So again, if we go back to the beginning, he started then with $5. So 50 big blinds. He put in 50 big blinds with a week two pair. And uh, called that big flop raise with just top pair. Really badly done. I mean, look at this. He just has a pair of tens. He called my big raise against the tide for tightest player at the table. Horribly done. Could have been avoided. Didn't have to happen. This is why I I love the micros. I don't have a problem, by the way, with him calling that preflop raise of 50 cents. He has a double suited hand, triple Broadway double suited. Fine to see a flop with. Once this flop comes, you got to give it up. He should have been folding on the flop. That was really, really poorly played, and I guess, you know, he got what he had coming. Okay, let me call up the next hand. Hold on. Okay, guys, here's our next hand. Again, we're at Bavada. Again, we're at 10 PLO. I'm in the big blind with a pretty crappy hand. And so I'm only going to be in this hand because I'm in the big blind. As you can see, this is a junk hand. I wouldn't be limping this. I wouldn't be calling anything. I'd just be dumping this hand. But I do flop top two pair. <clears throat> I get lucky in that regard. Again, on a somewhat dry, but never a completely dry board. Because there are draws from ace to four and draws from four to seven. People can have a couple of cards that will give them a straight draw or something. So this isn't a totally dry board but it is on the drier side and that there's no flush draw. We don't have a bunch of uh, Broadway cards or something along that line. This guy checks. I go ahead and bet a little over half pot. I do decide to make a bet here, even though we are four handed. Uh, top two pair is, is a decent hand on a board like this. As you boat will often say, bet for value until people play back at you. If somebody raises here, I'm probably going to have to let this go. It's too easy for somebody to have a set, maybe even a big draw. I might call a small raise, but I'm not looking to get my money in with two pair like these other people will. Definitely not. But if I can thin the field, get a couple of folds, and then, you know, on a blank turn, I can very potentially bet again. Uh, this is not a hand that you can get at three streets of value. Or I could check the turn bet the river, call a bet on the river, something like that. <clears throat> it just depends on how the board runs out. But rather than check and give away free cards, I decide to make a bet here. But make me make it very clear, I'm not looking to, to play for my stack. Get a fold, get a call, another call. Well, the turn is about the best possible card. That's, that's a four-outer for me, and I just hit the nut full house. And that's a really good break, obviously. Wasn't counting on that, but it happened. This guy checks. I'm sure I'm going to be betting for value. I bet half pot. By the river, I'll probably try to get a little bit more in, depending who might be left. But here, I make the half pot bet. And now this comes. This guy raises me. That's interesting. So he called on the flop, and now he raises. And this guy folds. In terms of range, well, he could certainly have the same thing I have. He could have ace seven. He could have ace four. He could have a naked ace. Some people will do this with just an ace in their hand with good side cards. He could have an ace with like a king and a ten and something else and feel like he's pretty good here. The thing is, I've got the nuts. Nobody, I, Nothing's better than ace seven here. And I'm obviously going to want to get the money in. Because if he does have an ace with higher side cards, then, you know, if, let's say he's got a king and a queen and a nine in his hand. If any one of those three cards comes, I'm going to lose. So I'm going to want to get money in here. But that's what I say. He also could have a set 
if he does, he's in trouble. If he has a set of sevens or a set of fours, he's in trouble because now I've got his full house dominated. And if that's the case, he should have been raising on the flop. He should not have been calling my bet. Oh, what the heck happened? Oh, it jumped forward. My bad, guys. Let's get back to this hand. I hit the wrong button. Okay. Sorry. Let's just jump into where we were. Hit my boat. I bet half pot. He raises. So I, re I just go all in. I re-raise him. He goes all in. Let's see what he had. He had a set of fours. Wow. So this is terrible. <clears throat> this could have been avoided. You notice he just called on the flop. He slow played the hand. And I hit a four outer to beat him. A seven would have also beat him. Yes, he got unlucky. But he let it happen. If he raises on the flop, I, I pretty much fold my top two pair. Because I know that somebody is probably has a set. Even though this guy's 7345, this is really terrible. Because now he's crushed. Only thing he can hit to beat me is a four. He's got one out. And if he had raised on the flop like he should have with his set, then I, I would have dumped my hand almost positively. I might have called a small raise if he'd made it 48 cents or something, but as soon as the turn, if turn didn't improve my hand, I'm gone. I'm not going to stack off with two pair. But... I'm sure he feels very unlucky that this happened, and yes, I hit a four-outer. But if he raises on the flop, I've always told you guys, don't slow play your big hands, and don't slow play sets, even on boards that don't look that wet. There's no true dry boards in PLO, guys, and this is what happens when you slow play. And he had bottom set, too, uh, the most vulnerable of, of the sets. And so I'm sure when he saw my hand, he just went, oh, God, how unlucky is that? Now he's got to hit a four. He doesn't. And I take his whole stack. And I win a really big pot. Almost $19. Because he let me get there by slow plan. Really bad. Really, really, really bad. Could have been avoided once again. But, all right. Hold on a second. I'll get our next hand. Okay, guys. Here's our next hand. Once again, we have some more 10 PLO on Bavada. Here I sit in the cutoff. A nice uh, Broadway hand with a suit. I limp behind. Again, great hand to see a flop with. It is triple suited. I'd rather it be double because I'm holding one of my outs for a flush. But when you have all Broadway cards like this and suited to the ace, it's, it's a still a nice hand and a good hand to see a flop with. And we're going to go five-handed. I flop top pair and the nut flush draw. Not a bad flop. Once again, against four opponents, I'm not looking to stack off here. But I'm definitely willing to call a bet because I do have the flush draw. I do have a pair of aces. Much more interested in the flush draw, by the way, than the pair of aces. Pair of aces isn't going to be much unless another ace comes. Maybe if a king comes or a queen. And we're down to maybe two people. But against four players, I'm not going to be paying for a ton of money with even two pair. As you guys know from the last hand and anything you know about me in general. But this isn't a bad flop given given my hand. So this guy bets full pot. First hand at the table. Get a call. Like I said, I'm going to be calling here. Even I'll call full pot. Because if I can hit that flush, I will pretty much have the stone cold nuts. At least at that time. And you can, as you guys know, Flushes are one of the hands you can make your most money with in PLO. Because people will pay you off with other flushes, as we've seen, and they will pay you off with hands worse, like uh, two pair and sets. <clears throat> and again, versus Hold'em, it's just so much more likely that somebody has a big hand. I won't even say a flush, but in, in Hold'em, how often does somebody hit two pair? Not very often. I'm not sure if you guys know, but in PLO, if you go, say, four-handed to the flop, 70% of the time, somebody has two pair or better. By, uh, may not necessarily on the flop, but by the end of the hand. 70% of the time. I can tell you for certain, in Hold'em, you go four-handed to the flop, you don't see people get with two pair 70% of the time. 
not even close. So it's just so much more likely that your flush will get paid off because somebody's going to have a big enough hand and is probably dumb enough to do so. So everybody calls and now we have a fairly good sized pot going. And as good fortune would have it, I hit my flush. Now there is, you know, a couple straight flushes out there. I just want to point that out because this is PLO. Somebody has two four of diamonds or four seven of diamonds, they have a straight flush and I obviously can't beat that. But even in PLO, the odds are not that strong. And if somebody has that, I'm probably going to pay them off. The only time I might not, just to point out, is take a player like this. There's only one hand. But let's say that I had 30 or 40 hands on this guy. Not a huge sample, but enough. And he was very tighter than me. Look, I'm 14-0 here. So if he was playing like I was playing, and all of a sudden he's willing to dump his whole stack in on this board... And look at this, I got the ace, ten, and queen. <clears throat> I, I would seriously think that he might have the straight flush. Against me, is he really going to, he maybe would put it in with the king high, but he's not going to do it with a jack or a nine. So in a case like that, I might think about folding. Might. But against anybody else in this circumstance here, no. Uh, if they have a straight flush, congratulations, sir. You took my stack. But I'm not going to fold when that's all it'll beat me. But I want to point out, you do have to sometimes at least consider that. So we get a check. So look at this. So this guy bet 50 cents, full pot on the flop. Now he bets 22 cents into a 272 pot on the turn, which leads me to believe he doesn't really like this card. But again, why don't you take out a full page ad in the New York Times and just tell everybody that card was bad for me. When you bet like this, you're just telling the world that. Check, you freaking idiot. Check. Just check. What, what, what does this accomplish? I just don't understand it. We get a call. Well, I think you know what's going to happen here. I'm going to be raising. And indeed, I do. I'm not going to play for 22 cents on this board. Uh, I need to get value for this nut flush. Absolutely. I need to get value here. And... Um, in addition, if somebody has a set or two pair, you know, there's a little bit of protection in there, but there's mostly value. There's just pretty much value or 90% value. I'm not going to just do 22 cents and then try to raise it on the river. If somebody has a hand they like, then they'll call, and if they don't, they won't. But I'm not going to play for, for one-tenth of the pot. That's just silly. Get a fold. Yeah, so this 22 cents was just ridiculous. And this guy does call. The river doesn't really change anything. And I don't, the only thing that could have changed something would have been if the board paired. The river doesn't change anything. This guy checks. Well, I just go all in. The pot was 690, I believe. 690, I've got 516 left. It's a pretty easy call. He calls. Now they don't show his cards. I don't think. I don't think I can see his cards. For some reason, it doesn't show his cards. But I do have Bavada here to show. <clears throat> here he is, right here, the guy that lost 785. As you guys can see, he has the second nut flush. King high flush. I had the ace, he has the king. And he loses uh, the majority of his stack there. So, you might say, well, what's the point of showing this hand? Okay, he has a king high flush. He has the second nuts. You have the nuts. So what? Okay, you, you, you could argue that. What I want to say about this is, again, I've said this many, many times in many of my videos. You've got to consider your opposition. PLO is not the same as Hold'em, and you have to always be thinking about what hands uh, do you logically beat. that your opponent, you know, would hold and, and that they would act that way in this situation. So I've got 21 hands, he's got 23. So we've been here the same amount of time. If he's observing at all, and obviously I don't think he was, and you can see, I mean, look at 14-0. 
That's tight in Hold'em. In PLO, that's nitty. I was not getting any cards. You can see this. Look at this, guys. I'd folded every single hand, basically, except for, I guess I might have seen a flop on this one, except up to now. So I folded, you know, 19 to 21 hands. 19 to 21. I finally play a hand. Now, he does have the king high flush, but he's got to ask himself, you know, is this guy going to stack off with the... Remember, if I had just the queen high flush, let's say I didn't have this ace. Take this out, replace it with any card you want to. So now I've got the queen high flush. Am I going to raise like that I did there? Am I going to put my stack in? I'm probably just going to just going to check the river there because I only have the third nut flush. That's not enough to really be putting my whole stack in most of the time. Maybe against some crazy maniac, not against a 52-9. No way. So when he's sitting there with the king high flush, he's got to say to himself, was this player the tightest of the table that's folded 19 of 21 hands? Is he going to put all the money in with a queen high flush or a jack high flush? The answer is no. But I don't think he even asked himself that. He just said, I have the second nuts. I never fold. Well, that can be a mistake. I'm not saying he played the hand horribly. I'm saying that I think, once again, it could have been avoided. I don't think he had to lose his whole stack here, per se. Yes, this is a tough one. Maybe some people disagree and say, no, you're just never giving that up. But I believe in the game of PLO, you've got to know your opponents. You've got to always think about not the raw strength of your hand, but what hands does your opponent play that way, make the bets or raises or calls that he's doing in that situation that you beat? All that it matters is what hands do you beat. The raw strength of your hand, that doesn't matter. All that matters is what is the opponent doing this with that I can beat. If there's nothing that they logically do it with that you can beat, it doesn't matter that you have the second nuts. It doesn't matter that you have a full house or a set, or, or four of a kind. If you've got quads, and you think the only thing that this guy who's playing 2-0 over a, a thousand hands can do it with is a straight flush, then you got to fold. That's a super extreme example, I know, and I'm not saying you'd ever fold quads, although, who knows, I'm just saying it's not about the strength of your hand, no matter how strong it is. So, please, guys, bear that in mind. I would still argue that this guy didn't have to lose his old stack. Even with the second nuts. Okay. Let's uh, move on to our last hand. And I will be... Okay, guys. We are back. And I just want to point out, here's a session that I just played the other day. And again, notice. All these hands... Mostly folds. A few small hands that I played here and there. I want to buck on this one. A couple of small ones here. Got the one big hand. So again, with live play videos, there's just not a lot to see. I'd almost have to have eight tables going to have enough action sometimes. But this is the one hand that we're going to look at. And so let's do exactly that. So we have some more 10 PLO. As you can see, I've been at this table for a quite a number of hands. And notice I'm at 10, 1063, or post the big line, 1073. So I really haven't made any money at all because I just haven't had, I'm playing 7-2, over 60 hands, 7-2. So I am just a nit among nits at this point, but I'm just not getting cards. I'd happily play, you know, many more hands. I'm not going to play 83-0, but I'd happily play, you know, 30-15 or something, but I'm just not getting the cards. But again, bear in mind, I'm by far the tightest player at the table. Let's see if my opponents take notice of that, and let's see if they adjust accordingly. Get a fold, get a raise, a call, another call. Now, this is a hand that I could three bet. It is a very strong hand. Aces double suited, all Broadway. I could definitely three bet this. But even with a hand this strong, there will be a lot of boards I won't hit. And I'm okay going multi-way with a hand like this. Just aces doesn't play well, but I have all broadways. I have two suits. There's a number of different ways I can hit the flop. It's not just aces. It's not just a suit. So I'm pretty sure I just called here. And I did. But I have no issue if you want to three-bet this. If you're ever going to three-bet a hand, this is a hand. 
to do it. Just understand that, you know, you can, you can get a, be prepared to let it go if you don't hit the flop. Don't feel like, okay, I put a bunch of money in, I got my aces, I, uh, I didn't hit anything else, I got, I've got to go with it. Maybe against one, like maybe against this guy. If ever these two fold and this guy comes in, yeah, you're, you're just going to go. But not against an $11 stack, you better not be. So bear that in mind. And uh, I flop top set because that's what I like to do. Oh, once again, on a somewhat dry board, relatively dry board, but there's never any truly dry boards in PLO. Even in a raised pot like this, people can have low cards. Somebody can be sitting here with 2-4, ace 4-5 something, you know, hands that will give them draws. You'd be surprised. He checks, comes to me, I'm definitely going to be betting for value. We already know that. Uh, and probably half pot to two thirds pot. In this case, probably closer to two thirds. The reason why is that other than my set, I really don't have a lot of ways to improve. That might seem kind of silly to say, you know, you got top set, but this isn't Hold'em. And you're always looking to improve in PLO. I do have a backdoor flush draw. That's it. Now, if there was, if this was a seven of clubs, then I'd obviously feel better. Or if this was a three of diamonds, then I'd have a flush draw and I could improve. Here, unless I can hit a full house, I can't. Or hit an ace, I guess. Unlikely, though, in a raised pot against three opponents, somebody probably has one. I actually hope they do. Uh, so I'm more likely to bet closer to a dollar just because I want to try to get more money while they're still, you know, drawing. Possibilities people feel they can improve by the time of the river, I may not get much more. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I just, you know, my hand's more vulnerable. Even though it's top set, it's more vulnerable when I don't really have many ways to improve. If I have a flush draw, I have a lot more ways to improve. That's nine additional outs. I don't have any of those nine outs here unless I get a, you know, a, a diamond or a club on the turn. That's one less street. So I probably bet more like two-thirds pot. Yeah, I bet a dollar. I like that. You can bet half pot. I don't have a problem with it. I just prefer to bet a bit larger when I don't have as many ways to improve my hand. Get a fold. Get a fold. And this guy calls. We notice he's 8320. This is a loose player. You notice the telephone. Stationy, loose player. I don't know if he'd lost a bunch of money before. If he started out with a smaller stack, I'm not sure. We can see he's not particularly aggressive. But he's obviously plays a lot of hands. The turn obviously doesn't help me any. I don't pick up a diamond. I don't pick up a club. It does bring a straight draw out there. A straight, actually. This, again, is why I bet you know, the dollar on the flop. If someone had four or five, well, they did just get there. It also puts a, a heart flush draw out there, and I don't have that. Now, given his stack size, the pot, I don't think I'm going to be folding. If he had 4-5, congratulations. But, obviously, this card does not help me. So, this guy checks. And I go ahead and bet full pot. <clears throat> he only has $4 left. I don't want to pussyfoot around, bet half pot or something. I just want to put it to him. Because he could, this could have given him a flush draw or something. That could have given him a straight draw. I'm just basically saying to him, look, pal, I'm ready to play, you know, for stacks, so to speak. Are you? Uh, he did call my flop bed. He has something, I'm sure. Um, if he had $12 here, uh, I maybe wouldn't bet full pot. I'd still bet something between half and full. But in this case, given his stack size, I'm, I'm fully prepared to just go ahead and, you know, uh, stack off here. It won't be for my whole stack, but you know what I mean. I'm fully prepared to play for everything he has. So he puts his money all in. Let's see what he has. I call, obviously. So I think this is pretty bad, my opinion. So on the flop, 
he had a gut shot in a pair of threes, right? Ace, two, three, four. So only a five is going to give him a straight. That's at most four outs. A pair of threes can't be good. So he calls my dollar bet, though, which I think is pretty marginal. Honestly, I would have folded it. Well, first off, let, let's be on. Let's go to preflop. I would not have called that raise. He's in the small, but out of position to everybody. And he calls the raise with two, two, three, four. I know the cards are sort of connected here, guys, but it only takes a, you're only going to hit a very specific flop with this. So this is a poor preflop call, in my opinion. This is a crappy hand, but he's 83, 20. That's what they do. On the flop, he just only hits a gut shot, really. The pair of threes is pretty meaningless. He hits a gut shot. He calls a dollar bet into a dollar 40 pot. Now, the turn gives him a set of deuces. That's bottom set. He's up against the tightest player at the table, by far, by far, who goes ahead and puts the money all in. Am I going to do that with just a pair of aces or even, you know, a two pair? So, again, I think this because his bottom set just isn't good a lot of the time. I just don't really like this at all. And now he's drawn to one out. He has to hit a deuce. Nothing else. A three won't help him. The straight. Well, I guess he could hit a five. I stand corrected. So he could hit a five or a deuce. So he's got five outs at most. That's it. He has to hit a five, right? That'll give him a straight. Or he has to hit a deuce. A three isn't going to help him. A four is not going to help him. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think this is good. I think he should have folded pre, and, and I don't think even the flop call was, was very good. I really don't. On the turn, he could argue, well, I have a set. I'm not giving up. But I think if he really thought about the range of a 7-2 after 60 hands, he's been here 40, so even say 40 hands. But look what I've done the last 40 hands. Template. What kind of cards am I putting all my money in with? Or most all my money? I mean, I'm sorry. I just, I think this was avoidable again. I do. So now he's drawing super thin. He doesn't get there. And uh, I take his stack. Once again, guys, I just feel this was avoidable. He could have folded this preflop and he would have saved, uh, let's see. He didn't have a full stack, but still. 529. So that is uh, 56 big blinds. Yeah, 56 big blinds. He would have saved, uh, oh no, this is 10 PLO, my bad. Yeah, 56. So $5 would be 56 big, 53, sorry. 53 big blinds. So he would have saved 53 big blinds had he just folded preflop. That's a pretty good amount, half a stack. I mean, I'm sorry. I just think that was really poorly played, um, especially against somebody who's playing 7-2 over 60 hands. Part of that's because I'm card dead, but you don't play this tight if you're not a tight player. And this was just unnecessary. So that's all that I have for you for today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this uh, episode of why I still love the micros. And you can see why. People are willing to make bad mistakes like that and hand their stacks over. That's a good thing, especially when I'm not getting any cards and I'm forced to play 7-2 over 60 hands, which is pretty ridiculous. So... Uh, as always, leave any questions or comments in the forums, any ideas you have for uh, videos you'd like to see or anything else, and I'll be happy to do that. Uh, until next time, guys, this has been CF The Natural for Grinderschool.com, and as always, good luck at the tables.